Next on BYU Sports Nation, an offseason of major change continues for BYU basketball. What impact will the latest bombshell have after Nick Emery announces his early departure? Utah's pick to win the Pac-12. Good for you! Does this change your outlook on the matchup to start the season? Plus, what would a breakout year for BYU quarterback Zach Wilson look like? And what publication says it's likely to happen? Let's go! This is BYU Sports Nation, brought to you by the BYU Store, simulcast on BYU TV and BYU Radio. Now, from Studio B, here's Spencer Linton and Jerem Jordan. BYU Sports Nation is live, your day-to-day play-by-play in Studio B, presented by the BYU Store, the official outfitter of BYU fans everywhere. Hope you're enjoying your Wednesday, July 24th, wherever and however you're connected. Great to have you with us. I am Spencer Linton, teamed up with not an NBA player, Jerem Jordan. Happy Pioneer Day to those who celebrate that in Utah and otherwise. Uh, here we are. It's a ghost town in the building. It is observed. But we are here, dang it. We got a show to do. We catered all 50 states, not just one. Yeah. So here we go. Uh, Kyle Collinsworth tweeted, I, I'm a NBA player. When like, you use the acronym, it has to be Ann, right? I believe it's Ann. I keep telling my daughter we're reading a lot. She's six, going into first grade this uh, next month. And she says A a lot. And I'm like, well, it's pronounced uh, typically. <laughs> when it's not the letter, it's in a sentence, whatever. So, so people are like, wait, one, isn't it Ann? Two, did you just sign with an NBA team? Is he so, playing in the NBA next season? So we don't know the answer. He was in the G League last year. He got hurt, didn't play for a while last year. I'm hoping that Kyle Collinsworth is in a training camp with somebody. That'd be great. In Kyle's grammatical defense, maybe he was <laughs> intending to say, I'm a National Basketball Association player. Sure. And with Twitter, because 280 well, characters wasn't enough for that tweet. It's, yeah, it's whatever. <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. Really, we're just interested to see what that means. Yeah, hopefully he's in the NBA. Kyle Collinsworth, will he be joining the ranks of the NBA once again? I don't know. I think it's time we get him on the show. We should probably get on that, right? Kyle, come on the show, man. It's been a minute. All right, there you go. The invitation is out for Kyle Collins with at Big Rush of Five because that's his Twitter handle. That is his Twitter handle. Here's today's show lineup. Former BYU basketball head coach Steve Cleveland will join us to break down what The Nick Emery departure means for BYU basketball, roster-wise, emotionally, and has he ever handled a personnel situation like that in his coaching tenure? Plus, TJ Fredette, general manager of Team Fredette, as they get ready for the basketball tournament. Utah Regional, going to be fun. Jimmer's a coach with Dave Rose. Tyler Haas is playing. A lot of BYU ties there. He'll join us to preview the tournament. Here are today's BYU Sports Nation headlines. As we broke on the show yesterday, BYU basketball senior guard Nick Emery announcing his retirement from basketball on social media yesterday. Emery played three years at BYU with one year of eligibility remaining, concluding his time with the Cougars, averaging 12.6 points, 2.9 rebounds, and 2.3 assists per game. What kind of vacancy does he leave? He was expected to contribute on a team that is Valuing its experience this year, but they lose a key cog with Emory going early. Athlon Sports says BYU quarterback Zach Wilson is number 12 in its top 25 breakout QBs of 2019. How about that? USC's JT Daniels, number 7. Toledo's Mitchell Guadani is number 15. More on what we think this looks like in a moment. BYU defensive lineman Kairos Tonga named to the Bronco Nagurski Trophy watch list. Given to the nation's most outstanding overall defensive player. Tonga recruited 30 tackles, two sacks, four and a half tackles for loss last season. Of the 92 players selected, nine BYU opponents were included on that list. And offensive lineman Brady Christensen joins Tonga on the Outland Trophy watch list for best interior lineman. BYU has won two of these awards, by the way. 86, Jason Buck. 89, Mohamed Elouanibi. Christensen started all 13 games last season as a freshman. We speculated yesterday that it would probably be Kairos Tonga and you brought up Brady Christensen, so nice call yeah. on that. And in our watching the watch list a week ago, uh, or on Friday, uh, I mentioned that James Empey could also be on the list. So we got uh, two of the three. There. All rise and shout. It's time for What's Trending. You're talking about it, and so are we. It's What's Trending on BYU Sports Nation. Now that Nick Emery's departure has settled in a bit, 
albeit it's still an emotional situation for the Emory family, for the BYU basketball family, and for fans. Now it kind of feels like we need to push it forward. Okay, the decision's made. He's gone. So what does it mean for the BYU basketball roster next season? It means they have one less scholarship to play. It's really difficult at this juncture to find anybody that's really going to contribute, in my opinion. I, I think it's tough. Unfortunately, this is when Nick decided. Good for Nick. It's whenever, right, for him. But for the team, this puts them in a pinch to find someone to replace him. It's not like Nick was just a, a whatever player. He was a guy that had been an all-league performer. This is a guy that uh, was top 11 in made threes and uh, steals. I mean, he was – had he played all four years fully like he did his freshman year, he would have been top five in BYU history in scoring. He set the BYU freshman record for threes made in the season with 97. Incredible, right? And unfortunately, he's had a lot happen to him. Things he's done, things that happened to him, some really serious things you know, off the court um, with him. So let's push it forward. What it means is that BYU needs to find – a point guard to replace T.J. Haas with this scholarship, in my opinion. If that's a guy that transfers and sits, that's fine because you're going to have to replace another guy that I would argue that T.J. Haas is one of the top 20 point guards in BYU history at this point. Perhaps he climbs in 15 or 10 when he's all said and done. Connor Harding will develop quicker because of this move, in my opinion. Nick Emery last year was struggling, didn't play the first nine games. We saw Connor Harding start to emerge. When Nick uh, Emery was put back in the lineup, we saw Harding kind of pull back a little bit. I think Connor Harding is going to be an all-league performer when he's done at BYU. Not necessarily this year, but I think he's a double-digit scorer. It's one less senior without Nick Emery. It's one less kind of leader. You could argue that, hey, the last two years, Nick Emery kind of hasn't been the same guy, so it's not a huge loss, but the idea of what Nick Emery could be is a loss to me. Sure, and I think BYU fans were hopeful that Nick Emery would show up for this season like he did for his first game back against Utah State. Right. Where he's making plays on defense, knocking down big threes. That was his best game. And that was one of my favorite moments in Nick Emery's career was watching him come back and play well against a really good Utah State team. Yeah. But I think it was unfair to expect that from him every game just because there was that natural emotion, there was that energy. It was his first game back, and then he kind of wavered again. So We I never think- saw freshman Nick – after his freshman year. We never saw it. it. A la Tanner Mangum. We never saw that guy again. Yeah. Right? In a lot of ways, it kind of felt like he was a shell of himself. Sure. Trying to find his and, way back and in. And I get it, you know, with the off the field uh, or off the court stuff. Y- you could argue, too, like, hey, this guy gave BYU some violations. He punched a guy. Like, it, it, it's been a complicated situation uh, with Nick Emery, a guy that I really like personally. Um, hopefully, BYU can replace that production, right? Now, what this means is opportunity knocks. Yeah, Connor Harding's going to have some serious opportunity to step in and fill that role. I think he's a starter for sure now. What does it mean for a guy like Jesse Wade, though, Jerem? Like, with the guard rotation and maybe even a guy like Trevin Nell, like, what do those guys do? All of a sudden, are they going to be called upon to now do some more things? Or is it just, hey, Connor, take the bulk of these minutes, the bulk of the shots, and do some stuff that we expected Nick to do. And how does BYU replace him defensively, his natural defensive aggression? I'm a little concerned about that. Yeah, good on-ball defender, really aggressive, right? Yeah, Jesse Wade has been a guy that's been a little banged up during the summer. He's not quite been able to uh, be healthy and go full go a ton. Uh, Perhaps the backup point guard with Jesse Wade. Now, I thought Trevanel might be a guy that you might redshirt, but now I think he's got to play. And what does Colby Lifeson do? Is he kind of the fourth string shooting guard or whatever? We'll see. Zach Selius is another guy that I know he's a forward, but maybe he takes a he's few a more three point three shots. Or stretch four, right? Yep. Okay, topic two. This morning, the Pac 12 media picked Utah to not only win the South Division, but to win the league. Barely. Oregon and Washington cannibalized the vote. There were 35 votes. It was split basically evenly, and Utah had the most votes with, uh, I believe, 12. Uh, does this change your outlook on the game August 29th? A little bit. And I can't tell you how much I love that Utah was picked to win the Pac-12. I love this. I've been screaming from this microphone, ramp up the expectations. Oh, the Utes are so great. Make them higher than ever. Oh, my gosh. They're the best. This is a unique position. (laughs) They've never been picked to win the Pac-12. 
Now the pressure is really yeah. on. What are you going to do now, Utah? They're supposed to dominate BYU now. They're oh, the best team in the Pac-12. Independent, 7-6 and six a Don't year have ago. any business being on the yeah. same field no as way. Utah as the preseason Pac-12 champions. We're way. going to Pasadena. Weaklings. The Rose Bowl calls the Utes. Okay? I no, the college football playoff does, love Spencer. This. I love it. <laughs> Ramp up the expectations. I'm with you, man. There is more pressure on Utah. They've never dealt with something like yes. this. This is the most hyped Utah team of all time. Ever. It is. Nothing to lose mentality has taken on a new role for BYU. The Cougars shouldn't win this game. Nobody should expect BYU to win this game against the preseason Pac-12 favorites. The Cougars were 7-6 and six last year. Oh. They couldn't beat Utah when they had Blow their a, backup quarterback. Blow a 20-point lead. And their 17-string running back. <laughs> it was a linebacker. But who, who cares that BYU was playing with their fourth-string running back and had their a different quarterback. starting quarterback? Yeah. Yep, yep. Yep. Regardless, mm -hmm. all the pressure on Utah. If BYU beats Utah now, Jerem. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That idea is so if, pure. If so BYU pure. beats Utah, this may be the best Utah team that BYU has ever defeated. Okay. There is that opportunity. Yeah. There Pre is that opportunity. We'll see how Utah shakes out. There's no way Utah lives up to all this hype. No way. Ramp but, it listen, up. Utah's really good. Don't get me wrong. Like that defense, really good. They lost a lot of uh, uh, linebackers. The offensive line suspect a little bit, right? Like Tyler Huntley's a good quarterback. He's shown it can just be okay at times as well. What other preseason power five pick to win a league would only be a six point favorite in Provo? Uh, Alabama, Oklahoma, Ohio state or Clemson. Those would be the preseason picks in the other conferences. They would be at least a 17 point favorite. This is an indictment on the PAC 12. Okay. Okay. The margin of loss in the last six games for BYU and Utah is an average of 5.3. It's all been single digit. Losers talk about margin of loss. Yes, BYU's lost eight in a row. This is, this is a game that I don't expect BYU to win, but I know they can win. And I'm excited about it because it's a different pressure. Guess what? Utah has to beat BYU, has to beat Northern Illinois. They will beat Idaho State. And then you go to the Pac-12 gauntlet at USC. Right, a place where Utah won recently. How but do they exceed expectations? They don't. They well, they'd have to go to the college football playoffs. Yes. If, well, if they go to the Rose Bowl, that is a huge accomplishment. Right. Well, it, it's it's Rose Bowl or bust. Correct. Yeah. yeah. So that's a little bit scary if you were oh, a yeah. Utah fan, where it's like, oh man, do we really want to put that expectation on them, Rose Bowl this, or bust? This is the worst possible situation. For Utah in the preseason, in my opinion, because they have played so well over the years as the underdog. Yes. 04, BCS oh, yes. Buster. They've thrived 08, in the role. TCU and BYU were ranked in the top 25, right? And then uh, the last couple of years, they finally broke out and got that outright division title. Didn't beat Washington in a close game, and then they lose the uh, the de facto Rose Bowl yeah. JV game against Northwestern, right? The losers from the Big Ten and the, the Pac-12. Utah's going to be good. It's just a matter of how good. And I'm with you. The pressure that's on them right now is awesome. Utah's best seasons have come when they were off the radar to start. Yes. Now 08. what? Now what? BYU is in the same boat. 84. Off the radar. Yeah. Oh, wait. Quest for perfection. No. No. Dude. no. 10 and 3, but not good enough. 2006, right? BYU off the radar, finished 11 and 2 and ranked. 96. Really good. Yeah. 96. Yeah. 2001. Yeah. Like, you don't want the expectation because then where do you go? Only you if you're Alabama, you Clemson, Ohio State. Those are the only teams that thrive under that expectation. Wow. By the way, we're how many days away? The countdown to the youths. One week away from the start of fall camp, by the way. They report next Tuesday. They practice next Wednesday. Five weeks from tomorrow. And we shot a commercial last night with Zach Wilson. Had a great time hanging out with him. Stoked to see what he does in fall camp. Speaking of Zach Wilson, we told you that Athlon Sports has Zach Wilson as the number 12 quarterback on their list of breakout oh. quarterbacks for the 2019 season. But when you look inside of that, what does a breakout year for Zach Wilson look like? You can go any direction you want with this. Yeah, I, I, and I've said these numbers before. I, I will repeat them. 
3,000 passing yards. That's Agre- 250 a game. I'm looking at regular season, by the way. Yes. 3,000 passing yards, 250 a game. Two and a half to one TD to interception ratio, okay. meaning 25 TDs, 10 picks. I think he needs to throw more interceptions. Be more aggressive. I think that'll uh, push the ball down the field a little Guess more. what? Good quarterbacks throw interceptions because they try and make tight throws and, and they're confident yeah. to do so. But you, you don't want to turn it over, but it's like a punt if it's third and ten or whatever, right? I want him to rush for 350 yards. That's after sex. Uh, that's 29 a game. That's fair, right? Okay. Just a couple of th- four to five of those. Brandon Doman ran for around 450 his senior year. Yeah, the Dominator, man. I st- still have a notebook, I think, from that. Um yeah, those, that's what a breakout year for me would look like for Zach Wilson. And, and the unquantifiable, like, decision-making at Boise State, don't take a sack to lose that game, right? I don't, I don't blame that game entirely on him. I blame that moment, certainly a choice he made. U- Utah, I think, was the staff and, and the aggression level with the play calling, right? At that point, some injuries played into that. But he's one guy, he's certainly an important cog. But that's what that looked like. I'm going to go a different direction with this. A breakout year for Zach Wilson includes eight wins, Jerem. Going okay. right to the wins. Progress. Okay? Breakthrough. And a winning record against rivals. Because lately, mm-hmm. no BYU quarterback has been able to do that. For Zach Wilson to show me that he's gone next level and taking this BYU team with him to a new level and is truly progressing, he'll beat teams like Boise State and Utah State, and just maybe Utah. And we've joked, if Zach Wilson is the quarterback that beats Utah and snaps the losing streak, his legacy is solidified forever as the guy that got BYU over the hump. I think there's some real truth to that. It's bigger than just one game, but for me, it's eight wins. Is it to the fans? And a winning record against rivals. Now, to go along with your numbers, I'll say this. Zach Wilson's got a few things going for him already, including our stat of the day. It's the BYU Sports Nation stat of the day. Zach Wilson's 65.9% completion percentage is the highest of any BYU quarterback in independence with a minimum of 180 pass attempts. If he had qualified at that number nationally, he didn't throw enough. 18th in the country. Wow. Woo. Uh, this just in from, uh, let's see, pick six previews, 2019 playoff prediction, Clemson, Georgia, Ohio State, Utah. So, you know what? If Utah doesn't make the playoff, I think it's a disappointing season. I'm yeah. just going to put just that go out put there. Put it on the record. For all the Utah fans, uh, yeah, this is what it was like, I guess, the whole decade of, most, I guess, most of the 80s. Was You're, so, yeah. pick six previews says Utah <laughs> is going undefeated. Okay, that, that's what it's going to take for Utah to get into the, the national playoff. Okay. Perhaps. One loss, maybe. An undefeated season for Utah, most likely. Hey, what? <laughs> they, could, they could probably lose. Ra- just ramp them up. Yeah. Hey, don't win the Pac-12. So many Notre Dame's Go to good. the college football playoff. Just keep it going. There's, BYU has no business beating this Utah team if they're going to play in the college football playoff and win the Pac-12. <laughs> just why? You know this what? This is the perfect scenario. Why even play the game? You know. This is the perfect scenario. <laughs> Our question Apparently of the it's day: over. How does Utah being picked to win the Pac-12? or go to the college football playoff for that matter. <laughs> Change your outlook on the BYU-Utah football match. Let's go to Voice of the Nation. This is the Voice of the Nation on BYU Sports Nation. At Crispy Nick answers on Twitter. It's all just speculation. Uh, Last yeah. I checked, both teams have zero wins and zero losses. Neither have proven anything either way. Again, I'm okay with this because if Utah wins... Well, congratulations. You were supposed to win. You're supposed to win. If you go to the Rose Bowl, congratulations. You, you, were, you supposed were supposed to, to go to it's, the Rose Bowl. It's way more satisfying overdoing it, right? Uh, it you want to exceed, exceed expectations. expectations. Yeah, exactly. Correct. Coming up, how much coaching will Jim Fredette do with Dave Rose and Tyler Hodges? We'll ask TJ Fredette. But first, another coach and a former one at BYU, Steve Cleveland, back on the show. What does the absence of Nick Emery mean for BYU basketball and – who does the opportunity knock loudest for? This is BYU Sports Nation. BYU Sports Nation is presented by the BYU Store, the official outfitter of BYU fans everywhere. For the latest and greatest content from BYU Sports Nation, you can follow us on the social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Live from Studio B with your day-to-day BYU Sports play-by-play, I am Spencer Linton alongside Jerem Jordan. If you're just joining us, 
We have learned that BYU's opening opponents, the Utah Utes, have been picked to win the Pac-12 overall. Over Oregon and over Washington. Now, Utah received 12 first-place votes. Oregon received 11, and Washington received 10. There are two votes missing in that count because there were 35 members, right? But, yeah, so Washington and Oregon cannibalized the north, right? And then Utah picks up the most, so they're in, right? The Ross Perot, if you will. Of this, listen. Utah is going to be good. Absolutely, let's Utah, be clear. In fact, I think they'll be very good. The question is whether they'll be great, and they're being predicted to be great. David Shaw, a moment ago, the head coach of the Stanford Cardinal, just said, "I'm very glad not to be playing Utah this year." Now, Utah beat up on Stanford last year. Utah is really good. You, I am peanut butter and jealous of the Utah Utes. I am. I wish BYU was the preseason pick to win a Power Five league and in a position to go to the college playoff, that would be awesome. Instead, we're hoping to get eight wins as an independent. You know, like, it's just a situation where it's different. And uh, if Utah loses every game besides the BYU game, it, or I want BYU to win, and then if Utah lost all the other games, great, whatever. If Utah's really good and the only loss is BYU, does that help BYU? Whatever. Utah's going to be really stinking good. Can BYU Pick them off somehow in the first game. The answer is yes. Do I expect it? No. Outside of Alabama and Clemson, if I'm rooting for any college football team, I don't want the pressure of going to the college football playoff or winning a Power 5 conference. I would rather exceed expectations. If Utah's 10-2 and in the regular season, it might be a disappointment, given this standard. Now. That is crazy. Right? And you... Utah has been one of the best, most consistent teams in the country. Kyle Whittingham is one of the best coaches in the country. I would say top ten. They're a really good program. Like man. you set the bar high. Yeah. How do they exceed that? There's just not much room to go. They above have to that. go to a New Year's Six game. They do, either as an at-large or the champ. And we're talking about one regular season loss or zero to really put them in position to do that. Obviously, if you win the Pac-12, you get you win the South. First half to win the South. We're talking a lot about Utah here. You know what? Enough of this. Let's talk about Utah as it relates to BYU. This isn't Utah Sports Nation. It it, it is a part of this BYU conversation because they opened the season against the Utes, and I'm telling you. No, that's what I'm saying. Enough about past the BYU game. It's, it's, who cares? Whatever. Here's where, here's why we're talking about it. Because if Utah doesn't live up to expectation, it's somehow satisfying for BYU fans. (laughs) It is. That's what it is. The the blue just is bleeding out verbally. Like, why do we care about Utah? Because they're the rival. It it is. But what I'm saying is we probably should mind our own beeswax beyond the BYU game. But part of being a BYU fan is hoping those guys stink. Well, you know, it, it But de- they don't it stink. Listen, they're gonna be really good. Yeah. They're gonna be really good. My point is I am a of the standpoint that you just don't want that type of high expectation because if you don't like and you're disappointed, like 10 and 2 would be a it's, disappointment. That's crazy talk. Yeah, it's an acknowledgement of where the program's at right now. BYU's right and the right rest they, of the league. BYU yeah. is mentally like this is good for the Cougars that they're not expected to win. Like they can play, they, they, haven't can, been they can play for loose. Wow. Yeah. 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 It, yeah. And, it's it hasn't changed anything. Joining us now on the Deseret First Credit Union Hotline is Steve Cleveland as we shift our attention back to BYU basketball now after we learn that Nick Emery is foregoing his senior year of eligibility and essentially retiring from basketball. Coach, welcome back to the show. Let's start with this. What was your initial reaction to hearing Nick Emery will not play his final year of basketball at BYU? Well, I was surprised uh, because I had watched him in practice and saw how committed he was, but I also understand it, uh, you know, in terms of his life. The last couple of years have not been easy. There's been some challenges, and it's been kind of an emotional roller coaster. And I think uh, from the perspective of basketball, I know it's something that he loves, and uh, I think he could have made significant contributions. But he's a young man that's been through a lot, and I think he's had good mentors, and I think he feels like, you know what, this is the time for me to step away and focus on my new family and my getting my, you know, like going and getting on with my life. So I respect him for it. He's taking ownership in it, and he'll be missed. Uh, but uh, the Cougs will move on, and, and I think there's lots of depth in this team to make up for his loss. Let's just talk about on the court. What's the legacy of Nick Emery? Because we have had a few you know, weird, weird things that affected on the court. Obviously, 
the Brandon Taylor incident of Utah and the NCAA violations. Yet, this is a guy that made 97 threes as a freshman and was a really good on-ball defender. It wasn't quite the same guy after his freshman year. And I was hoping to see that, that freshman Nick, his senior year now, like re-energized. But what do you think the legacy of Nick Emery on the court is? You know what? I think the legacy is going to be the, the fact that here's a young man that lived a really public life, uh, went through some significant challenges, and got through it all. And we know what his ability was and how great he was as a freshman and what we were hopeful of this year. But I, I think more than anything that when people see others go through difficult times and take ownership for it and work through it and are successful and move on, you have great respect. And that's what I'll respect. And I think that's what everybody respects. Anybody that knows Nick yeah. is not thinking back on that day at Utah or any other event or whatever took place with the NC2A. People make mistakes. And uh, he took ownership for it. He moved on. He's, he's a better person for it today. I think he's in better health mentally and emotionally and physically. And I think he's got a new family. Those are the things I'm going to remember him for. Certainly, he had a sweet jumper. He played with great intensity and energy. Uh, a very tough, a tough young man on the floor and competed all the time. So I remember those things. But outside of basketball, those are the other things that really mean the most to me. Talking with former BYU basketball head coach Steve Cleveland. If you had a one-on-one -on -one conversation with Nick right now, what would you say to him? I would, I would tell him, number one, that uh, I, I would thank him. I would thank him for his effort. I would thank him for his attitude, for his humility, for his willingness to change and make changes in his life. And I would tell him to move on because the best part of his life is in front of him. Uh, love his wife and his family. And uh, those are the important things. And so... He knows that. He understands that. That's why he stepped away. He knew what was best for him and for his family. So uh, I, I would congratulate him on making good decisions and wish him well and hope that uh, he'll be able to, whatever he's going to pursue professionally or anywhere else in his life, I uh, wish him the best of luck. This move does put the BYU coaching staff in a bit of a pinch going into this next season. It, had it been in, say, uh, April, it's different than July 24th. At this point, it's highly unlikely that BYU gets a player that contributes in a meaningful way going into the season. So do you think BYU has to go that route, or do they find a guy to, say, replace T.J. Haas that has to redshirt and sit out a, a transfer? You know, I, I don't, uh, I, I'm not sure where they are in terms of recruiting because I haven't talked to the staff about that. But I honestly... I think they have a lot more depth. I mean, just getting Jake Toulson at 6'5", to come in, player of the year in the WAC, uh, he kind of fills a void really quickly. Jesse Wade, who hasn't played here, but has been in a really good Gonzaga program that can shoot the three. And I, and I think another young man that can certainly play the guard position, not, not necessarily like Nick, but I think Connor Harding is going to be a young man that is a player of the future here. And with TJ, with Jake, uh, there's plenty of players here. There, there's no question that uh, they'll miss Nick, but I think they have the depth. Uh, Celius and, and uh, Nixon are both coming back after kind of so-so years. They're going to be focused. You've got a new coaching staff. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't think – I think Nick's loss won't be that significant. It just gives other, the other players an opportunity to step up. They've got a couple of young players. But I think with Toulson and Wade stepping in, they can fill that void quite easily. Coach, is it fair to expect BYU to make the NCAA tournament this season with the latest roster shakeup? Yeah, I mean, I think that's what the coaching staff's goal is. I, I do. I mean, I, you look at their schedule. They've got a lot of home games now against Vegas, San Diego State, UNR, you know, teams that they had to go on the road. They've got a great schedule. They've got the Maui tournament. They're, all of the indexes, every, all the analytics for how we evaluate a team to go into the tournament, they've got a great schedule in place. They have re returning about 75 or 80 percent of all the statistics, offensively, defensively, free throws. I mean, they got a lot of people back, so there should be great optimism. And you got a new staff, which always brings great optimism and a new approach. So this team's prepared to get to the NC two A tournament, and Gonzaga is going to always be good. But I promise you that this is not the Gonzaga team of the last two years. I mean, Tilly and Petrosen and Kispert, Gilder, they're all good players, and they're going to have a great year but it's not what it's been in the past. Sam Mary's does return their whole team, but, you know, BYU can compete and beat them. So I think this is a great opportunity for BYU to step up the NC2A tournament, but there might even be a WCC championship available. It's not like Gonzaga has 
Final Four talent. They've had it for a long time, but they've taken a little bit of a dip. Not, I know that they'll still win 25 games and be in the tournament, but I just do not believe it's going to be the same Gonzaga team we've seen the last two or three years. Do you feel like that, will manif- that opportunity will manifest itself in the regular season race or primarily in Vegas, like last year where St. Mary's beat Gonzaga? No, no, I, I think that things are – you're taking a look at Pepperdine, USF, Santa Clara, Loyola, all pretty solid teams in the middle of this league. BYU, St. Mary, Gonzaga have the talent and the experience. Bottom half, at least, not great. But I, this, is, this is a league that BYU can win. I mean, I, and I'm not trying to put pressure on anybody, but there's enough talent there, and there has been enough attrition at the Gonzaga at, 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 that they're, they're meeting each other somewhere in the middle now. And certainly, let's not discount St. Mary's because they beat Gonzaga, the same team who was just outstanding. And Randy Bennett does a great job. But I think it'll be a, a three-horse race again. And Pepperdine, being a team that got some experience in the tournament, is a dangerous team. But I still feel it'll be the top three. But I think BYU steps up here. Having Yoli come back and having Toulson and Wade, the guys being a year older, Connor Harding being a year older, I think this is going to be a really, really good basketball team. And I know the coaching staff will be unbelievably prepared, high energy, and uh, will ha- have these guys really accountable and focused on what's going on. So uh, I think the combination of both uh, makes it – the. I think the future is bright for BYU this year. I'm, and I'm not – I don't have the blue goggles on here. I'm being very realistic. They, they can have a really good year. They, you know, Barring no injuries and other situations, I think this is going to be a really good basketball team. We're with you on the excited about this team train. In fact, the day that, you know, Yoli Childs came back and we knew Jake Tilson was there, we said, this team's going to the tournament. Like, we think this is tournament good. It is interesting to see, though. Let's, let's look at this. This is a 19-win team that didn't make the NIT last year. They add Jake Tilson, essentially, and they have a new coaching staff. Yet we expect this big improvement. Is that mainly because of the coaching staff? Because it's the roster plus Jake Tilson. Well, you, there's the other thing. Gavin Baxter and Connor Harding were young players last year. They are going to be substantially better this year. So the improvement level of those two players alone is going to be huge. T.J. Hahn, a senior, he'll take it to a next level. Yoli is going to be really committed. So he, and, I, and I expect Sellius and Nixon to really come out. I think with this new coaching staff that there will be a great deal of energy. So I think that the team – individually gets better than collectively the sum of their parts gets better as well just through the experience and uh and you know i I don't know defensively and offensively what they're going to do i don't think it's going to be that earth-shakingly different i do think there's going to be a different energy and a commitment than uh than maybe there was last year with the new staff you just you always have that so uh I, i i think that yeah having nick would be wonderful but uh at the end of the day he's not there he's moved on and there are enough people to fill the holes and, and uh, have a great team this year. And the schedule at home is, is solid. Obviously, the Maui Classic is a tough way to start. But, uh, I'm not, you know, UCLA is, is kind of rebuilding as well. So it's a neutral court. Things happen. You never know. So, but, again, when you look at, their, at the year as a whole and you look at their scheduling and the index of their, of their schedule and who they play and where they play, this is a schedule that is preparing this team to be in the NC2A tournament. It meets all the criteria. You look back and say, well, what a great schedule on the road, neutral sites, playing top 20, top 50 teams. So the schedule sets them up if they play well, even win or lose, to put themselves in a position to get to the tournament. Coach, it's great to talk to you. You bring up some fantastic points. Uh, let's do it again soon, shall we? All right, take care, guys. You Bye-bye. got it. Steve Cleveland on the Deseret First Credit Union Hotline. Deseret First, you know why. We show how. If BYU won the West Coast Conference regular season, that would be incredible because of how good Gonzaga's been. But Steve Cleveland's right. They're not going to be as good, but how good? Are they still top 20 good? Because do we think BYU's going to outplay that team over 16 games? That's like tough. Yeah, this, this Gonzaga team, I think, will be somewhere between 15 and 25 in the top 25 rankings all season BYU's long. BYU's not going to outplay them in a 16-game tournament, right? But that's fine. That's fine. Because if you win the regular season, you don't get into the NCAA tournament. Pick up a few it big helps. wins in non-conference. 
Beat Gonzaga once, beat St. Mary's once, win 24, 25 games, have an RPI or, sorry, a... Thank you, don't ever. Index <laughs> number that is, you know, Top 40. Top 40, yes. Be top 40. Then Gonzaga then won the league business. by five games last year. The year before that, one, one, zero. Mm. Tied with... So St. Mary's has been in that position. Will BYU be in that position? We shall see. Coming up, this life is amazing. Jimmer Fredette's brother and GM of Team Fredette, TJ, previews the Dave Rose Tyler Hoslett team. But first, more of your responses about BYU football and their season opener. Have things changed because the Pac-12 favorites are coming to Provo? This is BYU Sports Nation. Welcome back to BYU Sports Nation alongside Jerem Jordan. I'm Spencer Linton. You're in the state of Utah or around it and celebrating Pioneer Day. Hope you're enjoying that. If you're, you're in Oklahoma, country, you don't care. It's Whatever. Just, it's just great to have you watching the show regardless. So happy Pioneer here. Day to everyone wherever you are. Yeah, no one else is in the building, but we are. <laughs> yes, we are. We work I'm working a people. full day today. Let's we go. Work for the people. Got stuff to do, man. Here are today's BYU Sports Nation headlines. Maybe you missed it. If you did, don't know how you did, but Nick Emery has announced his retirement from BYU basketball courtesy of a statement on Instagram. Emery played three years at BYU, does obviously have one year of eligibility remaining, which he will forego. He concludes his time at BYU averaging 12.6 points per game, 2.9 rebounds, and 2.3 assists per game. Really good on-ball defender. Now BYU and coach Mark Pope going to have to figure out how to plug that hole. Athlon Sports has BYU quarterback Zach Wilson as the number 12 in its top 25 breakout QBs of 2019. USC's JT Daniels, number 7. Toledo's Mitchell Guadani is number 15. Defensive lineman for the Cougars, Kyrus Tonga, named to the Bronco Nagurski Trophy watch list given to the nation's most outstanding overall defensive player. Tonga recruited 30 tackles. Two sacks, four and a half tackles for loss last season. Of the 92 players selected on the list, nine BYU opponents were also included. And Tonga joins offensive lineman Brady Christensen as well on the Outland Trophy watch list for best interior lineman. Christensen started all 13 games as a freshman at left tackle. I want to say this about Zach Wilson going back to the Athlon Sports breakout season. We had an opportunity to spend a few hours with him yesterday. And I cannot tell you how amazingly obsessed he is with football in general. He's so smart with the X's and O's. And I'd be like, what do you mean by that? What's that? It, like, he just, he sees the field and knows what's like, I'm not sure he has other hobbies, which is good. No, <laughs> yeah, clearly, like, he has an obsession He's obsessed. with football. It's great. We all like great. football. That dude lives it. Yeah. Breathes it. Yes. It's all he does. I'm excited to see what he can do. I'm excited to see him, you know, off shoulder surgery and uh, getting healthy. And, like, that, it's exciting. He's got a quarterback that we feel like can compete with some really good teams. And it's been a minute since we felt like that, right? So yeah. let's go. Well, I like how real to the situation he is. Going back to media day and yeah. our conversations yesterday with, yeah, it's, it's, it's tough to come back from shoulder surgery and expect to be able to throw the ball as hard as you once could. And I just like that he's real. Like, he's confident, yeah. he's brash, but he, he has a realistic approach. Yeah, I like it. Takes That's hard cool. work. One week from uh, fall camp today. He expects to outwork pretty much everybody he plays against. Yeah. Yeah, very impressive. All right, our question of the day. How does Utah being picked to win the Pac-12 change your outlook on the BYU-Utah football game to open the season 36 days from now? At Denton Good on Twitter. I love it. They are used to playing with an edge chip, speaking of BYU, because they normally get doubted. Hopefully, Utah comes in all full of themselves. That's the challenge for Kyle Whittingham and his crew now. Is It's a unique challenge, right? Okay. Typically, they played a certain card, and now they're playing a different card. Yeah. yeah. But it's, it's good to be loved, right? But now they have the pressure. So it's interesting. Trust me, I'd, I'd rather be on that end than this end. I would. Because <laughs> BYU would be in a Power 5 conference. That'd be <laughs> awesome. Coming up, which Cougars start training camp in the NFL today? And we are joined from... Salt Lake City by TJ Fredette, the general manager of Team Fredette, as they get ready for the basketball tournament. What does he think of Jimmer signing with Panathinaikos? And more importantly, what's Jimmer's role this year in the basketball tournament? This is BYU Sports Nation. BYU Sports Nation is presented by the BYU Store, the official outfitter of BYU fans everywhere. Saturday, the best of BYU Sports Nation airs at noon Eastern on BYU Radio on podcast feed as well. The best conversations and interviews each week 
uh, play there. I really hope what we said about Utah in the opening block makes it into best <laughs> WA Tour station <laughs> this week. <laughs> Joining us now on the Deseret First Credit Union hotline as he prepares for the basketball tournament, general manager of Team Fredette, TJ Fredette. TJ, welcome back to the show. How are you? What's up, TJ? Hey, what's up, guys? I'm doing good. How are you? Fantastic. We're ready to watch some uh, high-level basketball in Salt Lake City this weekend. The TBT is always fun. Jimmer played in it last year. Now he's coaching, and he's part of your coaching staff that uh, you are the general manager of. What has you most excited about this year's version of Team Fredette? There's a lot of things that I'm excited excited about with this roster. Um, I'd say probably in particular, I'm really excited about the depth that we have and the versatility. We have so many different lineups that we can put on the floor. If we got to go big, we can go big. If we want to go small, we can go small and run teams to death. There's just so many different options. We got shooters. We got a little bit of everything. So the offense is going to be really explosive and just that versatility uh, being able to throw different lineups out there, I think, is what I'm most excited about, seeing how the team gels with, with different units on the floor. Certainly has a BYU flavor, hence the need for the conversation. Uh, it feels like Jimmer and Brandon Davies got too good. They're not on the team this year, right? That's a good problem to have, I guess. I know, I know. You can't replace those two, but um, I'm really happy for the opportunities that both of them have. And, you know, it's it's tough. You know, you got to weigh your different options and, and guys are away from their families a lot. So you, you can understand them making the decision to, to sit it out this year. Definitely got to respect their, their choice and we'll, we'll definitely miss them, but we're happy for them and the opportunities they have going forward. The roster does feature BYU's all-time leading scorer, Tyler Hawes. Who else should fans keep a close eye on specifically? You know, there's a lot of guys on this roster to, to keep an eye on. But um, in terms of some newcomers that we have, there's two guards named uh, Two Holloway and Rob Gray that are incredible. Keep an eye on those two extremely explosive scorers, both of them capable of putting up 40 any given night. Uh, both had played really well in the NCAA tournament back when they were playing. Um, two great pros. Those are definitely two two players you can't miss that are new new additions to the team. And also, BYU fans that remember uh, Jimmer's days when he was playing will probably remember Darrington Hobson. And a healthy Darrington Hobson, which he is now, is is dangerous. He's a guy that can do a little bit of everything, NBA-level type player. So I keep an eye on those guys, but I'll tell you what, everybody on this roster um, is capable of getting things done and definitely can't miss talent. Was it a no-brainer to have Dave Rose coach this team? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, as soon as I heard that he was retiring, that thought immediately went into my head, but I didn't really want to ask him. <laughs> I, just felt, you know, I just felt like this guy's a legend, and, you know, he probably wants to relax and enjoy his family, enjoy the off season. But so I, I text him just to see if he'd be interested in coming, just making an appearance. Maybe we could do something at halftime to honor him. And he was like, Oh, absolutely, TJ. Anything I can do to help out with TBT. And so when he said anything I can do, I was like, that, did that open the door a little bit? Like I, <laughs> I had to at least find out. So then I'm like, Coach, would you be interested in coaching? And I couldn't believe it when he was like, oh, yeah, absolutely. That'd be a blast. And I was just like so excited. Just landed a legend as our coach. He's definitely going to be the best coach in the tournament. And we're so excited to have him. That's just that's big time. Does Dave Rose have the final say in everything that happens, or do your dad, Al, and Jimmer, and you get involved in this? Like, who who has the final say? Well, we're we're involved, but I told Coach, you have the final say. You're the coach. You're the one who who, who knows what you're doing above everyone else, and you know this is your expertise. So we definitely want you to be the one to make the final decision. We will give our input. We'll give our help. We've had some some calls, and we've. Um, given our thoughts on the roster and different lineups and things like that. But in terms of final decision, I don't want there to be any gray area. It's all with coach. And so I let him know that and he's ready to roll. He has a questionable hire with an assistant coach by the name of Jimmer Fredette. Um, how good do you <laughs> yeah. think Jimmer's going to be thinking. as an assistant? 
I don't know what he was thinking with that hire, but uh, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Jimmer's going to be great. He, he knows the game in and out. You know, if he wanted to be a coach someday, he definitely would be a great coach. Um, he does well with the players and, and just knows different scenarios. So, you know, him and coach being able to be back together and working with each other on the sidelines is going to be magic. Um, so they've already been talking a little bit, and they work so good together. So it's going to be a great fit. As Jimmer's biggest fan and longtime supporter, TJ, what do you think of his next professional opportunity in Greece playing with uh, a powerhouse over there, Panathinaikos? I'm thrilled about it because, um, you know, I've seen some of the footage of the games over there, and the atmosphere is unbelievable. I mean, the closest thing I've seen to the old BYU days. I mean, it's just so electric. The fans are so into it. Um, So I think that aspect of it is going to be something special. And then the fact that this team is just so good, you know, they have so much talent and like you said, they are a powerhouse. So being able to, you know, he hasn't really had an opportunity to win anything in his professional career. Unfortunately, just hasn't panned out being on teams that were able to make runs in the playoffs anywhere. So, being on a team that really has an opportunity to make some noise, win a championship, and maybe hopefully do some damage in the Euro League as well, that's something that I'm I'm thrilled about. It's just uh, it's, I think it's going to be a great fit for him and an unbelievable opportunity to play over there. TJ, it's great to catch up with you, man. Uh, really quickly, how do fans get involved with the basketball tournament? So you can go to thetournament.com. And all information is on there in terms of scheduling and uh, the bracket and how you can buy tickets. Tickets are still on sale, pre-order. Uh, you can also just show up at the Maverick Center. We kick off July. Tw- we kick off Thursday, so July 25th at 8:30 Utah time. Um, and it also, I'm gonna put stuff out on my social media, and we have Team for Debt social medias on Instagram and, and Facebook and Twitter. If you want to follow me or follow the team, um, we'll put up links on how you can watch the games in the Salt Lake region because our first games are going to be on ESPN3, which is um, an online streaming through ESPN. So we'll make sure we get the information out there so that everybody can have a chance to watch. And then we plan on moving on, being in Chicago, and those games will be televised on ESPN and ESPN2. So we'll get the word out there so everybody can watch and be involved. Outstanding. Great to catch up with you, TJ. Thanks so much. Thank you guys so much. Great to talk to you. We'll see you guys soon. All right, you got it. TJ Fredette on the Deseret First Credit Union Hotline. Deseret First, you know why. We show how. Looking forward to that tomorrow. Coming up, what incoming freshman is on a USA Volleyball national team? And which BYU Cougars report to NFL camps today? This is BYU Sports Nation. Shout out to today's guests, Steve Cleveland and... TJ for debt. Shows on demand via the podcast and the BYU TV and BYU radio apps. Let's whip it. Okay. It's time for the Cougar Whip Around. Cougars in the NFL. NFL training camp begins today for the following homies. Kainakua with the Panthers. Yoni Takitaki with the Browns. Jamal Williams of the Packers. Michael Davis on the Chargers. Kyle Van Noy of the Super Bowl champion Patriots. And my boy Ziggy Ansah on my Seahawks. Volleyball. Incoming freshman middle blocker Gavin Julian named to the USA Volleyball Boys Youth National Team. He'll compete at the U19 World Championship in Tunisia August 21st through the 30th. It's good to have great players. Yeah. Cougars in the Major League. Taylor Cole started for the Angels, recording two Ks in one scoreless inning of work in a 5-4 win over the LA Doyers. Cougars in the minors. Jacob Brugman continues his hot streak. Three for four with two doubles, a home run, three runs batted oh. in, and the Tacoma Rainers 10 to 7 loss to the Reno Aces. He has the karma, Jerem. Yeah, it does. In single A, David Clausen, DC Clausen, hit two home runs for four RBIs, two runs scored, and an 8 7 win for the Orem Owls. Woohoo! Over the Rocky Mountain Vibes. Brennan Lund is vibing. One for one with an RBI for the Salt Lake Bees and their 17-6 win over the Albuquerque Isotopes. And Michael Rucker pitched the final inning, recorded a strikeout for the AA Tennessee Smokies. Today's rise and shout out, a combined effort, Jerem. Kyle Van Noy doing some great work in his community. He took 80 foster and special needs kids to Lion King. So cool. He and Marissa are doing some great things. 
uh, in the community, which is really cool to see. And he definitely has a soft spot in his heart for those situations because of his own upbringing. Yeah, he was adopted. Yeah. Absolutely. Our question of the day, how does Utah being picked to win the Pac-12 change the outlook on the BYU-Utah football matchup, our elite voice of the day? <laughs> Presented by Sundance Mountain Resort celebrating 50 years. Stephen R. Facer answers on Facebook, it doesn't. The bigger they are, the harder they fall. Just ask Oklahoma, Wisconsin, Nebraska, DCU, etc. BYU will beat Utah this year. It would be incredible, right? We're all hoping for it. Sorry to Dennis Pitta, we ran out of time. The conversation continues 24-7 on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Use the hashtag BYUSN. For Jerem, I am Spencer. Shout out to Lake Hemuli. Hey, BYU's 36 days away from opening the season, Jerem. We'll be back tomorrow. Go Cougs. Yeah, boy!